as we're doing the song service during prayer uh, before the service started I just felt led I think this this scripture really helps with what I'm ministering with this morning and so I want to read uh, this particular scripture before we dive into um, 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and I'm going to read Romans 8 uh, verses 1 to 14 and so just listen to this now so now there is no condemnation to those who belong to Christ Jesus and because you belong to him the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death the law of Moses was unable to save us because of the weaknesses of our sinful nature so God did what the law could not do he sent his own son in a body like the bodies we sinners have and in that, the body God declared an end to sin's control over us by giving his son as a sacrifice for our sins. Verse 4, he did this so that, when, so that the, the just requirement of the law would be fully satisfied for us who no longer follow our sinful nature, but instead follow the spirit. And I think that text, that verse right there is key to what I'm ministering today. Those who, are, those who are dominated by the sinful nature think about sinful things. Um, this is why sometimes it's tricky to keep people alert at church. Um, but those who are controlled by the Spirit, by the Holy Spirit, think about the things that please the Spirit. So letting your sinful nature control your minds leads to death, but letting the Spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. But the sinful nature is always hostile towards God. It, it never did obey God's law, and it never will. That's why those who are still under the control of their sinful nature can never please God. Read a few more verses here. Verse 9, but you are not controlled by your sinful nature. You are controlled by the Spirit if you have the Spirit of God living in you. And remember that those who do not have the Spirit of Christ living in them do not belong to him at all. And Christ lives within you, so even though your body will die because of sin, the Spirit gives you life because you have been made right with God. Verse 11, the Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. And just as God raised Jesus Christ from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies by the same Spirit living within you. And verse 12, two verses left. Therefore, dear brothers and sisters, you have no obligation to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. For if you live by the... By the um, by its dictates, you will die. But if through the power of the Spirit, you put to death the deeds of the sinful nature, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. Last, uh, and sorry, sorry, that's the last verse right there. All who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. And I can go on because this whole verse, this whole chapter really um, deals with my sermon. I heard uh, a... Um, our past, one of our pastors, um, Pastor Mike, he says, if, we, if all we had was Romans chapter 8, we have enough scripture to live the Christian life. And so oftentimes when I'm fasting, this is one of the, this is one of the, the chapters I meditate on, uh, Romans 8, Romans 12, the book of James. I meditate, I deeply meditate on these chapters uh, because they, they, they're, they're just so powerful. But anyways, I wanted to read that launching into my sermon and so let's open let's read the um the, the text that i decided to write this sermon with i could have easily used any text that i just read to launch the sermon with but i just felt um to to really draw something out here that paul has said and so we're going to read first corinthians 8 1 to 2 just two verses of scripture the bible says now concerning things offered to idols we know we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. And if anyone thinks he knows anything, he knows nothing yet as he ought to know. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. God, I am simply a vessel, a sinful man. I need your grace. I pray go before me. God, right now, I am asking for an anointing, God, that will prick through the heart. I pray, Father, your children will be liberated, God, to live for you from this day forward. I pray you help me. I pray grace. Give me strength and power to declare this word 
with boldness and clarity. I'm asking you that you would soften every heart in this place in Jesus' name. Glory. Amen. My job this morning is to present a revelation I received from God. Amen. And I trust that God is going to minister to your hearts and empower you to go forth and live more fruitful lives. Now, I want to speak about the importance of walking and living in the spirit, but in a way that you've probably never necessarily heard it before. I'm not here to say that I'm saying anything new, well, but I really do believe that this is a revelation from God. And so I want to first present a problem. Everybody say a problem. Look at your neighbor, say a problem. Look at your neighbor, give him a high five. I'm kidding. COVID, COVID, COVID. No high fives in here. I want to present a problem. I want to present a distraction. Because in life, whatever obstacle uh, you know, we have to, to successfully live the Christian life, how many know God has an answer? Whatever it is, for, for fear, God has faith for us. How many know that? For weakness, God offers power and dominion. Right? And so there are issues in life, but God provides an answer for our sin. He's given us the blood of his son, Jesus. And so what we have is we have answers that God has provided for us. But what Satan does, and we see this early in scripture, what the enemy is so good is he will always craft a distraction or a problem for you to somehow try to fight your problems with a different way. If God says that's the only way for you to leave, Satan will tell you to jump out the window. He always tries to provide some sort of distraction, some sort of way for you to consider a different way. God will provide salvation by grace through faith, but the enemy will come and tell you, you can work your way to heaven. He always provides a distraction. In other words, yes, let's listen to God. Yes, let's do what God is saying, but let's take a different route. Take a different way to get there. We know this is a problem because many will perish because of false religion. How many know Buddhists and Sikhs and Hindus can't get into heaven? Can you say amen? The church is not clueless to its enemies. By church, I mean the people of God. We know this. We know that we are, we are we're to overcome the world. We know that we're to resist Satan, and we know we're to conquer the flesh, and that's the title of my sermon this morning, Conquering the Flesh. And I want to present a distraction that Satan has fed the church to conquer the flesh. In other words, there are ways, there is a way that God has provided for you and I to conquer the flesh, to conquer our sinful nature, but Satan has come with a distraction. How we're going to conquer and defeat our sinful nature is ways that Satan has provided. Multiple ways he provides, but in scripture we see that there's one way. I want to present a distraction. The spirit, you know, the word that we read, the text that we read, Paul, he's dealing with the concept of food and the conscious. What you can versus what you cannot eat. How I many you know it's good to be mindful of the conscious, the weakness, and the strengths of the believers around you? And then he goes on to say, hey, listen, if Brother Nemi can't eat meat, if he, if he feels like something's wrong about, uh, about eating meat, I need to have love, and I, can't, I shouldn't be eating all my steak around him. And this is what he, he is dealing with. He's dealing with the, the conscience that different believers have different levels of, of conscience. Uh, Brother Mike gave me some baklava. And, uh, you know, if, if Aiden doesn't like that, I shouldn't be stuffing my face with that in front of him. I need to have love. But the Apostle Paul, he says something very interesting. He makes a statement. He says this, we know that we all have knowledge. And he says, knowledge puffs up, but it is love that edifies. My question for you this morning is, would you rather be puffed up like a balloon? Think of a, a deflated balloon. You put it in your mouth and you blow air. You're puffing it up. Would you rather be puffed up like a balloon and remain where you are? Or would you rather be puffed up and filled with air and exercise what you know by loving people and be a balloon that floats? Because many are just puffed up with, with knowledge. Uh, they're like a, a, a balloon that's filled with air, but just on the floor. But it's not until you exercise love that you begin to float. I hope you catch my analogy there. 
Don't just be puffed up. It's not just about having knowledge. It's not just about what you know. And I want to say this this morning. Uh, many are puffed up with knowledge. Many people have this view that Christianity is this walk where the more I know, the better I do. Can you say amen? Many people have this view that Christianity is about me having, me being a walking library. And the more I understand, and the more I know, and the more I can comprehend, all of a sudden I'm going to be a better Christian. But I'm going to tell you that's a lie from the enemy. That has nothing to do, that is not how we conquer the flesh. Um, write this down if you're taking notes. Many throughout history knew right but lived wrong. Many people have known what the right thing was but lived wrong. We can start with Adam and Eve, the very first human beings. Listen to this. Listen to this. Did God not clearly tell Adam that you should not eat a particular tree? He clearly told him. And so did Adam lack knowledge of what not to do? He knew exactly what he shouldn't be doing. But he did it anyways. Many in history knew right but lived wrong. When you, when you know, when the temptation came, instead of Adam yielding to the spirit and obeying his convictions, he gave in to his flesh. We can think of Solomon, the wisest fool we call him. Here he is. He, he has given us the wisdom books filled with purity and keeping a right heart. Yet, think of this man. He writes, Ecclesiastes and Proverbs, and, and, and he probably has his fingers in, in, in other Old Testament writings, possibly the Psalms or the book of Genesis. And so here he is, here's Solomon in all his wisdom. We always equate Solomon to the wisest man that walked the earth second to Christ Jesus. And here he is with 700 plus concubines. It's absolutely contrary to everything he, he taught absolutely contrary to everything he knew and so knowledge does not necessarily help you conquer the flesh here he is he's he has these 700 plus concubines who were pagans and were influencing him to worship pagan gods and so i want to look at this present time probably the most respected apologist in 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 the last hundred years a man named Rabbi Zacharias, and you know, it's, it's Christian talk right now. Everyone's kind of, you know, puzzled. Everyone's kind of, oh my gosh, you, you follow any kind of Christian talk shows on YouTube, and everyone wants to add their two cents to the situation and what's happened with this man. And so this is a man who is a stellar apologist, a brilliant mind. He passed, the, he entered into eternity late last year. He built a stellar ministry, raising many apologists who would defend the Christian faith. They would travel the world and go to different churches, university campuses, uh, and answer questions. You and I wouldn't even know where to begin, how to answer. This man had a brilliant mind. I'm telling you, um, his intellect was like a gift from God. The former president of the uh, vice president, rather, of the United States, uh, um, who was a believer, Mike Pence, uh, he spoke at Rabbi Zacharias' eulogy at his funeral, and he says that Rabbi Zacharias is a modern day C.S. Lewis. Who here knows who C.S. Lewis is? Show of hands, amen. Uh, just Tish, okay. <laughs> So he's a modern-day C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis, uh, you know, if you, if you look up quotes, a lot of good Christian quotes are from C.S. C.S. Lewis. Uh, and so he also had a brilliant mind in his time and age. Uh, and so the level of praise for Rabbi Zacharias' genius and intellect was enormous, and it was well-deserving. When you hear him talk, it's like, man, where is this guy from? Was this guy born in the clouds? Like, he's so intelligent. He, he dismantles atheists for living. He eats them like cookies for living. No atheist has ever beat him in a debate. It, it, he makes them look stupid. That's how high his genius level is. And it was well-deserving all his praise. Like I said, he's, he built a ministry around the world that's known around the world called RZM, R-Z-I-M. And this man passes, listen to this, he passes, he goes into eternity, and right after he dies, we start hearing after case and case of sexual abuse and case of, of rape, case of sexual misconducts. And so his ministry, what his ministry does is they hire a law firm to investigate these, these situations, these matters, because you, you can't just go by hearsay. 
And so, the, the, you know, the law firm began to investigate. And just about two weeks ago, they, they, you know, they released a final statement. And it wasn't the law firm. It was the actual ministry that released it to the public. Uh, and this is all out there for everyone to see. And so here you have this top world apologist answering the questions that Christians, like day-to-day -day Christians like me and you can't even begin to ponder. Here he is, and, and the, you know, the thing comes out, uh, and listen, listen to this. He had over 200 pictures of different women on his phone, uh, and, you know, obviously uh, unappropriate pictures. Okay, I don't want to get into details. At one point, just a few years ago, he had a full-blown adulterous relationship. He was a sexual predator. He would use and manipulate massage therapists. He would go into their offices, and before they give him a massage, he would, he would talk them into uh, doing sexual things with him, uh, and he would say, you know what? God is using you. And, he, and there's even cases where he would tell women and say, you know what? Let's pray for this opportunity uh, because uh, I have a lot of ministry stress, uh, and you're going to help me relieve some of that stress. And so you got to think about this. Uh, uh, here's a man with great intellect, but doing wrong. He knew right, but he did wrong. And his mistakes, and listen, I'm not trying to use him to bash him. The man's in wherever he is in eternity, he's there. Uh, but listen, what I'm trying to say, I'm trying to build a point. Uh, his mistakes gives us the conclusion that uh, what's going to inevitably take you out is never going to be a lack of knowledge but your own flesh. When you fall into, into, into sin, uh, you shouldn't say, I didn't know better, but rather you should say, I didn't yield better. Don't ever say, I didn't know better when you fall to sin, because it's not a lack of knowledge. That's not how we conquer the flesh. It's, I didn't yield better. Galatians 5, 13 to 18. Let's read. Here's the answer from Scripture, because Satan provides distractions, and one of the distractions is knowledge. You got to know. You got to know better. You got to, if you don't know, you're not going to, but listen, the Scripture tells us that the way we conquer the flesh, it's not by our own knowledge, but it's by yielding. Galatians 5, 13 to 18, for you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use your liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, that so you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, beware, at least you shall be consumed by one another. Verse 16, I say then, walk in the spirit. Everyone say, walk in the spirit. And you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led, everyone say led. You are not under the law. If you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. The flesh and the spirit, the Bible says they lust. In other words, they war against each other. I'm here to declare to you that if you give in to temptation, stop saying you didn't know better. Start saying I didn't yield better. Our text, our scripture teaches us uh, that intellect doesn't oppose the flesh. Only the spirit opposes the flesh. The only thing that you can use to fight against the flesh is the spirit. It's not knowledge. It's not head knowledge. It's not intellect. It's not I knew better. It's not I studied more. And this is not a, it's not an anti-knowledge sermon. Many of you know I shared with some of you, uh, you know, that I desire in the future uh, to go and do, do some course to, to get a, you know, a divinity course or something like that. I'm not against knowledge. I'm constantly encouraging people to have your study Bible and know the word for yourself. This is not an anti anti-knowledge sermon uh, but rather i believe that satan uh, has built this distraction to make people think that if they know they'll do but the reality is the only way to fight against the flesh uh, is to yield to the spirit of god uh, many men throughout history knew right uh, but they lived wrong the key to conquering the flesh is to yielding it is by walking in the spirit. It is by living in the spirit. It's by having, listen to me, listen to me. It's by having a constant awareness uh, that you are the temple of the living God uh, and growing in sensitivity to his voice uh, and his leadership uh, and his yielding. I mean, that you're to yield to the spirit of God. Uh, that is how Christians are to live their lives. Uh, you cannot live your life without the spirit of God leading you. You have to be led by the Spirit. There is no other way to conquer the flesh. Without being led, 
you will sin. It's that simple. If we don't yield, if we don't, yes, yes, Holy Spirit, you're leading me this way. You're building me up with convictions. You want me to do this. Yes, yes. If we don't yield, we will sin. There's no other way. It's by what you yield to. Sometimes, you know, the Holy Spirit, he leads us somewhere that's tough at first, but it brings growth if we continue to follow. He sometimes leads us to a season of difficulty, a season of hardship in life, but it brings growth in the end. We find growth. We, 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 we get to the point where we desire, we aspire to be. Listen to Matthew chapter 4, verse 1. The Bible says, then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And it's only 10 verses later in verse 11. Verse 11 says, then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and ministered to him. We know what happens in between that. We know Satan is like, yo, turn these stones into bread. Yo, bow down to me. I'm going to give you all the kingdoms of the world. And we know that Jesus was tempted. This is the great chapter of Jesus' temptation. We know he said no to everything that Satan had to offer him. We know that. But from verse 1 to verse 11, we see something clear uh, that Jesus was led into the wilderness. Sometimes the Spirit of God will lead you to hardship uh, in order that you can be ministered to by the supernatural. Verse 11 says, then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and ministered to him. Wouldn't you like to be ministered to by the supernatural? Angels came and helped them. They helped Jesus. They ministered to him, the Bible says. You know, there are people that say, I want to be led by the Spirit. I want to conquer the flesh. But you don't want to go through the wilderness. You want, you want, you want the glory. You want, to be, you, want to be, you, want, you want supernatural things in your life and all these things. But you don't want to go through the wilderness. I want to be like Jesus. I want to be led by the Spirit. Uh, but we, everyone knows that you're torn, you'll turn that stone to bread in a millisecond. Everyone knows that. That you'll give in in a split second. Uh, but, uh, but you say, oh, I want to be like Jesus. But you'll give in. People say, I want to be ministered to by the supernatural. But everyone knows that the minute the, kingdom of God is, uh, the kingdoms of the world is offered to you, you'll give in. You give in. Oh, I feel, I'm feeling like Pastor Stacy right now. I'm feeling like I'm preaching to a brick wall right now. Ain't no one working with me. Ain't no one helping me. I'm going to keep preaching myself happy, though. I'll tell you that much. I'm going to keep preaching. Listen, you, you, there are people, hey, uh, Pastor, I want, I want to grow. I want to, listen, everyone knows you'll give in. You know, everyone knows you'll give in. You know, God knows. Uh, the whole trinity, the host of heaven, every angel in heaven knows you'll give in. So it's not about what you say. Are you willing to yield? Here's the spirit of God leads Jesus to the wilderness. Satan comes and tempts him. Spirit of God leads Jesus away from temptation and away from temptation. And, away, and that's the Christian life. That's the Christian life. Is that we are yielding to the spirit of God. You can only conquer the flesh by following the Spirit of God. I want to make that clear today. Because it's not just against giving in to our sinful urges. Because this trickles down in other areas in our Christian life. So I want, I want to read something to you. As a church, we're reading a book on discipleship. And uh, he's, he, he starts chapter 5 off in a, a rather fascinating way. And so with these stats... And so this is true, not just for dealing with the flesh and, and dealing with sin, but this is true for evangelism. And I, and I want to end this sermon off and talk about evangelism. And so I, I want you to consider this. Majority of Christians in the world do not witness. You don't believe me? Listen, listen to these stats from this book that we're reading. Listen to this. 95% of all Christians have never won someone to the Lord. 80% of Christians never even share their faith. 
2% of all Christians are active in evangelism ministries at their church. 2%. He says, it, it gets deeper. He says, 63% of all church leadership hasn't led one stranger to Jesus in the past two, year, two years through the method of go ye into all the world. Many Christian leaders, they just write their sermons, they come to church, and they preach, that, and, and that's, that's about it. 49% of all church leadership spends zero time in an average week ministering outside of their church. Just go back to what I was saying earlier. 89% of all church leadership has zero time reserved on their weekly schedule priorities to go out to evangelize. And finally, 99%, listen to this, 99% of all church leadership believes that every Christian, including them, has been commanded to preach the gospel to a lost world. And so you think about this. He writes here in the book that we're reading. He says, notice the hypocrisy. They know, they teach, but they don't do and obey. And so he, 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 he lists, he says, listen, there's all these Christian leaders and, and, and 40, 49%, they, they spend zero time weekly. 63%, uh, they haven't led anyone to the Lord in the last two years. Uh, 89%, all of them, they spend zero time reserved on their weekly schedule. And, so, and then he says 99% believe that every Christian, including them, every single Christian. Did you know that you are called to preach the gospel to the lost? Do you know that? That doesn't, that, that's, that's not what this, listen, when you read the Bible and it says, go ye and make disciples, this is not what it is, what's happening here. It's, it's, it's not exclusive to me preaching to you. That's not what it is. What Jesus is saying is that you as an individual, you're called to go and preach the gospel. But you know what's interesting? You can agree with me and not do it. And that's the representation of the stats I just read. Because many agree and don't do it. I know Christians, they read their Bible, they pray, they live clean, they abstain from sin. And the, the, the idea of evangelism is this huge, pro, this huge program. Oh, I'm waiting for the church to say 50,000 to send us all to Timbuktu so that we can do a missions. That's their idea of evangelism. It's, it's, not, it's nothing weekly. It's nothing daily. It's nothing for them to exercise regularly. But I want to draw this home, what we were talking about, with being led by the Spirit. According to the Scriptures, evangelism is a Holy Spirit-driven, Holy Spirit-inspired work and activity. People can know but yet be crippled by fear and then lack boldness, which is a representation of the flesh. But here we are in Acts chapter 2, right after the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. The disciples, uh, that they were in the upper room, uh, they were filled, the Bible says they were filled with the Holy Spirit, uh, and the evidence of speaking in tongues, uh, they were, they, there was something about them, they were endued with power, the Bible teaches us, uh, and here they are, Peter goes downstairs, uh, he begins to preach uh, to Hebrew men and women, uh, and listen to what happens, the Bible says they were pricked to the heart. Here's a man who had so many struggles following Jesus uh, for three years. But the minute he is filled, the minute he is led by the Spirit, uh, the minute he's empowered, uh, now he's able to preach with an anointing that pricks to the heart. The author of this book, he says, and I quote, How did those first disciples have power to overcome their fear and their public preaching, and publicly preach Jesus to thousands of people? By the power of the Holy Spirit. The same is true today. I want you to listen to this. Because you're not going to go witness on your own. You're, you're not going to effectively witness on your own. Witnessing and evangelism is a Holy Spirit driven activity. It's not something you just do powerless. This is something that you need the Holy Spirit to, to propel you, to drive you, to empower you, and to enable you. He continues, he says, by the power of the Holy Spirit, the same is true today. God's Holy Ghost will power. God's Holy Ghost power will overcome your fear to stress with the street witness. Therefore, be filled 
with explosive fear annihilating power from the holy spirit and be jesus's public witness like the first disciple overcoming the flesh winning souls preaching the gospel with clarity and boldness so these are not works of the flesh and i'm going to tell you something christians who don't witness are not led by the spirit If you don't witness, if you don't, if you don't have, if, 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 if your issue is I'm, I'm afraid, that is a fleshly carnal work. That's the flesh. But when you deal with the spirit of God, there is power. And so I want to close with this. Are you yielding today? Are you yielding to the Holy Spirit in your life? Or is it I'm yielding for a little bit and I'm back to the flesh. I'm yielding to a little bit and I'm back. Are you yielding today? That's the question I have. Are you walking in the spirit? Are you living in the spirit? Are you yielding to the spirit of God? Every head is bowed. Every eye is closed. Amen. In reverence to God. Jesus says something in scripture. He says that the flesh is weak amen but the spirit is strong is that the case in your life can the strength of the spirit of god be seen in your life can it can it can the strength of the spirit of god be seen in your actions can the strength and the power of the Spirit of God be seen in your witnessing? Can it be seen in your convictions? I have a conviction. I won't do certain things. I have, I have standards for my life. Can, can the strength of the Spirit of God, can we look at your life and say you're on fire? Can we look at your life and say you're spirit-led? Can we do that? Or are you a, are you a walking library? thinking that this is i'm somehow going to overcome the flesh i'm somehow going to defeat the flesh but what i know many many men many women in history have known right and done wrong and i gave the example of adam and solomon and the late rabbi zacharias and there are there are many but what what about you this morning is this something that dominates your life well we're, we're we're under this assumption that man if i learn more about jesus i could be more like jesus you know something about Jesus' life is he was a man of the word and but he was also a man of the spirit and maybe that was the case for rabbi zacharias he was a man of the word but he lacked the spirit you don't want that. You need a balance. And then before we dismiss this morning, I want to give an opportunity. Maybe you're here. You're not a Christian. What that means is you have not been born again. Jesus says in scriptures, unless a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Very clearly what that means is there must be a point in time when you have been transformed by the spirit of God. Every head is bowed. Amen. Every eye is closed. Amen. We're before God. Amen. I wonder, anyone here, you're not saved. You haven't been born again. Amen. This can be your day. You don't have to leave here the same way you came here. You can be transformed. You can be changed. Listen, we serve a God of change. We serve a God of power. Listen, God wants to transform you. The Bible says, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old things have passed. Behold, all things have become new. You can become new today. I wonder, maybe that's you. You're saying, Pastor, I'm not a Christian. I'm not living for Jesus. If I was to die today, I have no assurance that heaven will be my home. Will you lift your hand all over this place? That's you. Amen. Quickly, quickly. We're not going to hold this for long. You want to give your life to Jesus. Amen. Praise God. I mean, I wonder if there's maybe someone here, you're a backslider, you were once living for God, but you went astray. You were at a certain point yielding to the Spirit of God. 
But now you notice that you are habitually yielding to the flesh and giving in to your sinful nature and giving in and giving in and giving in. And that's been the pattern for a few days, for a few weeks, for a few months, maybe for a year. But you want to return to yield again to the Spirit of God. Maybe that's you. You're backsliding. I want to tell you God loves you. I want to tell you, you can come back to Jesus. Lift your hand all over this place. Amen. Pastor, pray for me. Amen. I see that hand. God bless you. Amen. Anyone else? Amen. You want to return home. You want to return to Jesus. You want to come home. Amen. Amen. Listen, we're going to open these altars. And I, I want to say this. Paul tells us in Scripture to examine our lives, examine our hearts, examine our actions, examine where we are in our spirits. As you're sitting in your chair right now, can you truly say that your actions are spirit-led? We, we look at Jesus and we understood why he was in the wilderness. The spirit led him there. If we look at your life, the last week, the last two weeks, can we say you have been where the spirit has led you? Can we say that? You look at Jesus' life, every step he took was spirit-led was spirit driven can we look at your life and say that that where you've been the places you go to the people you talk to the things that you do can we say that these are spirit led things the altars are open we're going to stand to our feet amen we're going to worship god you come make decisions amen speak to god amen you come to the altar let's stand to our feet